In this lesson, we're going to move away from talking about the various different principles of the UK Constitution. If you remember, these principles included things like the separation of powers, the idea of the rule of law, and what we spent a lot of our time on, which was this idea of parliamentary sovereignty. And we're going to move on now for the next few lessons to start talking about the sources of the UK Constitution. Now, this lesson is going to be a very brief overview of what those sources actually are that we're going to be talking about in the future. And it should be noted that some of these sources are going to have uh, more lessons than others because some of them are more important than others. Some of them are more difficult to understand than others, for example. So, like I said, moving away from the general principles of the UK Constitution and examining the sources of the UK Constitution instead. And one of the things that's important to just as a very brief introduction, just to just to outline for us all here, is that the reason why we have different sources relating to the UK Constitution is because of our constitutional framework, because of the nature of the UK Constitution. Because the UK Constitution is what we call an uncodified constitution, this means that it is not derived from one single document. It's not like the US Constitution, where we see one single document um, from which we derive all of the general principles, and there are 27 amendments that we attach to that. Instead, we have a single document that is, uh, sorry, we have no single document that is codified that is the UK's Constitution. Instead, we have to look at a variety of different sources from which we derive our constitutional framework. And I've mentioned multiple times what the, the the consequences of having an uncodified constitution actually is. So, for example, or R, should I say, if I'm going to use <laughs> grammatical English, um, uh, we've mentioned the fact that we have a lack of entrenched principles. Um, generally speaking, there is no law that cannot be overruled by something else owing to the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. We've seen some minor challenges to that in relation to the Thoburn case and the idea of and the idea of there being maybe constitutional statutes, but for the most part. Even then, it is still the case that you can overturn, if you are parliament, overturn any legislation that was previously passed. In addition to this, we also have the view that the constitution is very flexible. It is easily changed. In fact, arguably, whenever a new piece of constitutional legislation is passed, it is changed. It does. It does change, and it and it and it sh is shaped and molded very very quickly. And if we look to reference the common law as well, whenever there are new common law decisions that are made, that also changes and modifies and develops the constitution. So, like I've said, the UK constitution is uncodified. It's not single. It's not written down in single uh, place. Now, some people and even some textbooks like to. Uh, make this uh, false comparison, in my opinion, between the idea of an uncodified constitution and the idea of a of an unwritten constitution, arguing that the the UK's constitution is not written, is an unwritten constitution. Uh, I believe that that's a little bit misleading when it comes to uh, explaining how the UK's constitution works. I can understand why certain textbooks and certain professors may may or academics may cite it in that particular regard, but I would argue that uncodified is a far more precise way of defining the nature of the UK constitution rather than unwritten because unwritten implies that it is unwritten it implies that it is just a bunch of conventions and general rules of thumb whereas in reality the UK's constitution the vast majority of the UK constitution is written is written down the thing that is different from this constitution and say for example the US constitution or a variety of different European constitutions is the fact that it is not all written down in one single place in one single document that's why we suggest that it is uncodified and so as a result of all this, we see that the UK's constitutional framework is divided into a multitude of different sources. And the sources of the UK constitution that we're going to be exploring are as follows. We're going to talk about statute law and secondary legislation first. Uh, again, we're not going to spend too much time examining it because we've talked about parliamentary sovereignty already. We've talked about what a statute law is, how parliament operates and all these different things. Uh, but then we'll also talk about the law of the European Union very briefly and i've put a little asterisk there because of course there is this tricky situation that we have to think about when we talk about brexit no longer do the does the european union uh, apply its law to the united kingdom but there are still lots of old law that still exists that is to an extent still um, 
derived out of and came from the European Union, even if it is still applicable in the UK. I will then talk about the common law, which is the judge-made law which is created by the judiciary. Uh, and then we'll start to talk about some of the more interesting and unique elements of, these, uh, of the UK constitution and its sources. So we'll talk about, for example, constitutional conventions. What are a constitutional conventions? what are constitutional conventions how are constitutional conventions made uh, what are the significance of constitutional conventions and what are some of the examples of constitutional conventions i'll then talk about the royal prerogative as a as a uh, as an element of the uk constitution specifically the idea of the constitution uh, being or the uk being a constitutional monarchy the idea that the monarch still has quite an uh, a large amount of political and legal authority within the UK's constitutional framework before finishing by talking about various different works of authority which exist and will contribute to the UK's constitution, some of which we have already explored in previous lessons. Welcome back everybody to Public Law. In this video what we're going to do is talk a bit more about the different sources of the UK's constitution starting with the concept of statute law, so law that is created by Parliament. We'll spend some time talking about statute law in this video, we'll talk about the parliamentary process and, and, and lawmaking in the next, and then we'll move on to the next uh, major source of the UK Constitution, which is that of constitutional conventions. So, one of the key principles which we have already spoken about when we look at the UK Constitution is the view that when we think about lawmaking, the process of passing legislation and having law enter into force, this ought to be done through democratic processes and through democratic means. And so this is why one of the major reasons for the lawmaking of the UK Constitution to include the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. Parliament is a democratic institution, at least the House of Commons is a democratic institution. And so as a result of this, Parliament has a significant amount of authority. In fact, Parliament has all of the authority when it comes to domestic legislation. The reason for this is because of its democratic nature. And so we're going to talk about parliamentary lawmaking, statute law, as one of the main sources of the UK Constitution in this video. So the process of creating law and the process of legislation passing through the Houses of Parliament is done through the various different institutions of Parliament itself. You have the House of Commons, you have the House of Lords, you also have the role of the Crown in the Royal Prerogative in the uh, assignment of royal assent to legislation, and you also have various different committee and subcommittee institutions within Parliament that work towards the creation of legislation. And in theory, if, we, if we're going to go even more detailed, when it comes to the actual writing of laws, this is done by things like the Law Commission, it is done by various different civil servants in and around Westminster and in and around the government who then propose that policy for Parliament to approve or, or to not approve. Now, one of the things that is very important about our parliamentary system is the idea that we call Westminster Parliament a bicameral legislature. Bicameralism simply refers to the fact that it is divided into two chambers. We have, of course, the House of Commons and we have also the House of Lords. Now, this is also compared that to institutions of or legislative institutions around the world where they may have tricameralism or they may have unicameralism where they may have one or three chambers also we can talk about examples where there are similarities so congress in the united states is bicameral just like parliament is congress has two chambers they have the house of representatives and then they have the senate exactly the same um, in terms of the number of chambers and so they are both considered to be bicameral legislatures Beginning first then with the House of Commons, it is made up of 650 members of Parliament, or MPs, from various different constituencies around the country. Essentially how it works is the country is divided into 650 sections from which there will be an election of a member of Parliament. Now the ways in which it is divided is not necessarily geographically, but more on the basis of population. The aim is to try and have roughly the same number of people in each constituent constituency at any one time. The reason for this is so that as every single member of parliament roughly represents the same number of constituents. 
because it wouldn't be particularly democratic when you have an MP that maybe represents uh, 100 constituents versus an MP that represents 10,000. That doesn't seem to make much sense because in terms of their democratic authority and in terms of their democratic mandate. So, like I've just said, the population of each constituency um, is roughly equal, so it is divided on the basis of population. So some of the more densely populated parts of the country will have more constituencies than some of the more sparse areas of the country. The population of each constituency votes for who they want to have represent them in Parliament. These are the members of Parliament. When you have an election, when you go to vote in your general elections and for your local constituencies, you're not actually voting for a party. You're voting for a member of parliament who represents a party. You're not voting for a prime minister, unless the prime minister in question is coming from the constituency in which you vote. You're voting for a local member of parliament um, who was going to represent you in the House of Commons. The political party with the largest majority in the House of Commons is the one which commands the majority, and it is uh, invited by the Crown to form a government. Uh, for the most part, it is the government, i.e. the majority in the House of Commons, who has a say on the formation of new legislation. Not to suggest that they're always the case, we'll get to some examples where backbenchers can propose legislation, but at least in terms of uh, for the most part, policy is directed and the policy schedule is directed by the government, the one with the majority in the House of Commons. And this makes sense given that the majority should have the mandate to be able to impose and implement policies. The House of Lords, on the other hand, is known as the Upper House. But this isn't to suggest that it has more power. It is also the unelected branch of Parliament. So just because it is called the upper house, it does not mean it has the same amount of power as the commons. In fact, it has significantly less power to the commons. It is completely subordinate to the commons in almost every single way. This is owing to the fact that the House of Commons is an elected democratic chamber and the House of Lords is an unelected, undemocratic chamber. So it doesn't make much sense to be living in a constitutional democracy for us to have a situation where the unelected chamber has more power than the elected chamber. The House of Lords can very rarely block legislation, so when you have legislation, for example, um, which forms part of the political party's manifesto, um, this um, cannot be blocked by convention um, by the House of Lords. This is known as the Salisbury Convention, which we'll get to in future lessons time. It is also very rare that the House of Lords can block the legislation passed by the Commons for a significant amount of time. This is owing to the uh, improvements and reforms that have been made by the various Parliaments Acts at the start of the 20th century. Essentially, um, they have very limited abilities to block legislation uh, and to send legislation back to the House of Commons. Essentially, if the House of Commons wishes to push through legislation as is, they have almost unilateral authority to do so. When it comes to the different types of legislation, in terms of its beginning stages, all legislation will begin as green and white papers. Government ministers will have civil service employees who are able to work for them and who will then automatically, uh, auto ultimately, shall I say, uh, advise them on matters of policy. The major policy issues are brought up. Uh, when they do, uh, the government department will issue what are known as green and white papers. A green paper is simply a document which outlines a topic of policy or potentially a topic of law reform and essentially is supposed to provide the government with some consultative guidance on this issue. So it's not supposed to be substantive in terms of its detail or terms of the things it's going to be uh, covering and regulating or how and how the law, the approach of the law will be um, essentially issued. It is more just a general outline of the topic of policy or potentially the topic of law reform uh, and give a general indication as, the direct, as to the direction in which it may go. A white paper, however, is a far more substantial position published by the government minister on what the government believes is the correct course of action to be. Sometimes law reform is particularly complicated. The law is often very slow to adhere to and to regulate changing issues within society. And so as a result of this, uh, white papers have to position themselves um, as having a very strong um, place in terms of what they believe the correct course of action to be on a particular area of policy or law reform. 
Law which is created, i.e. which goes through the House of Parliament and then ultimately receives royal assent is known as an Act of Parliament or, or Parliamentary Statute. Acts of Parliament represent in the UK what are known as primary legislation. All other lawmaking, lawmaking in terms of legislation making, is subordinate to Parliament. Before a piece of legislation becomes an Act of Parliament, as we know, it receives royal assent. We'll get to the parliamentary process in the next lesson. Um, but before it receives royal assent, when it goes through the various different stages of the parliamentary process, i.e. the third reading, second reading, committee stage, etc., etc., it is known as a bill. It only becomes an act, and it only becomes an Act of Parliament or, or a parliamentary statute when it receives royal assent. Bills are often started by government ministers, um, but there are other kinds of bills which may be able to exist. So when I said earlier on in this video that there are sometimes situations where backbenchers or non-government members of parliament um, can start and, and potentially um, pass legislation, this is through a number of different channels. The first of which is known as a private member's bill. Private members' bills are bills which are created and introduced by Parliament, um, to Parliament, should I say, sorry, uh, by a private member of Parliament, i.e. a member of Parliament that is not on, in, or around the government, essentially. So a non-government minister of state. Um, sometimes, uh, referred to as backbenchers, um, the private member is not a formal member of the government. And so essentially why they are called backbenchers is because they sit on the backbenchers of the House of Commons. Those who form the government and who form the shadow government are those who sit on the front benches of the House of Commons. So the people who are sitting at the front in the House of Commons are the ministers of state. They run the government. They will be the prime minister. They will be the secretary of state for education. You'll have the secretary of state for, um, for transport. You will have the um the the home secretary you'll have the chancellor or on the front benches and then opposite them on the opposite side front benches you will have what is known as the shadow government which is the essentially the leader of the opposition who is the uh, almost if you will is the almost is the shadow prime minister if you will um but then all of the other uh, all of the other roles are known as the shadow roles essentially so you have the shadow secretary of um, state for education the shadow secretary for uh, transport uh, the shadow chancellor all of which are supposed to be uh, part of the opposition who then scrutinize and, and really provide a lot of critique of the decisions that are made by the government for the most part, owing to the timetable of Parliament, the majority of government, uh, the the majority government um, holds uh, that essentially, uh, sorry, the the majority, the majority that the government holds, private members' bills do not receive royal assent and become legislation. On the most part, so there are some instances where we have seen private members' bills uh, actually pass into law, and even fewer of those where they pass into law and have any kind of significant influence or not aren't reformed at a later date quite significantly. But for the most part, because of the fact that the government holds the majority, and so therefore they control the timetable, private members' bills don't really get much of a say. So... Um, this is a, an example of, uh, of of a piece of private members legislation, which was not only um, private member, it was not a government piece of legislation, but it is also one that passed and it also was one that has significance even to this day, the Abortion Act of 1967. Now, one of the reasons why private members' bills are difficult to get through is because they are very difficult to introduce into Parliament in the first place. The two methods by which you can introduce a private members' bill to Parliament uh, is through the ballot process or sometimes the second process, which is known as the 10-minute rule. The ballot process is a process where at the start of each parliamentary session, a ballot is allowed. Now, here, what will happen is a bunch of different backbench MPs who potentially have legislation that they want to get through will uh, produce and they will suggest pieces of legislation. And here um, there will be 20 private members of parliament who are able to present their own versions of what legislation they would like to have passed through a parliament. Um, it's a very limited process, again, owing to the time constraints. And it is also limited in the sense that you need to get quite a lot of broad support from people who uh, are going to all inevitably try to disagree with you 
owing to the fact that you are, as a backbencher, in the minority compared to that of the government, um, who obviously hold the majority in the majority of times. The second and final way in which a, a, a private member's bill can be introduced to Parliament is through the 10-minute rule. This is the rule which essentially gives uh, members of Parliament um, the ability for them to be given 10 minutes to present a bill and or supporting a particular piece of legislation. Again, it's a very unlikely method for creating new law and ultimately what happens here is that even in the rare circumstances in which it is introduced, using either the ballot process or the 10 minute rule, it is often then very, very rare for that to then go on to become legislation because then it has to go through the parliamentary process, the process that we will look at in the next video. Finally, then, I just want to talk very quickly about the concept of public versus private bills. These are the uh, things that could eventually become legislation. Don't forget, bills are essentially um, uh, or, or almost um, pseudo law, where they they, they are they, they are the, the the sort of growing of a, the embryonic stage of uh, of law, um, and so they only become law when they are receiving royal assent. But it is at this point when you have public bills and private bills. Um, these types of bills don't necessarily refer to the people in Parliament who rep who present the legislation. What, rather, what public and private bills do is denote the interests in which the legislation is trying to regulate. So, for example, you have a public bill. Where a public bill is introduced, it is an intention for that bill to influence and regulate matters of public policy. It is public, i.e. it is open for the entire society, and potentially everybody in society can be bound to and have to uh, follow this particular new law. A private bill will impact a particular person or, as is mostly the case, an organisation. Welcome back, everybody, to Public Law. We're continuing talking about the sources of the UK Constitution, focusing again on the legislative process and statutory law. And we'll talk about the legislative and parliamentary process in this video. Now, this video is going to be very, very similar to that of our videos on the English legal system covering essentially the same topic. Uh, and that's essentially because public law and the English legal system has a little bit of crossover at this particular stage. So it doesn't really make sense to just make two different videos. I'm just going to essentially redo the, <laughs> this video again, um, but in the context of public law. So that's what I'm doing here. Um, and we're talking about the parliamentary process in this video. Um, this is the next uh, and continuing, sorry, should I say the major source of the UK constitution, the idea of there being statute law. The next videos will start to move on and looking at the other sources of the constitution, including the conventions, the common law, the uh, royal prerogative, all of these different things. Like I said, we're going to start examining the process by which legislation is passed through Parliament, the process of a bill becoming a law. We know that a, 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 a piece of legislation that has yet to receive royal assent is called a bill. And it is only a law and it is only binding onto the onto the people of the United Kingdom when it becomes a law through royal assent. So when it receives royal assent. So. The stages of parliamentary lawmaking are quite simple. The parliament that we have is a bicameral legislature, so there are two uh, chambers through which a piece of legislation has to go. Um, but the process by which it has to go through um, is the same in both houses. Okay, They have the same stages in both houses. So they go first through the House of Commons, then they go to the House of Lords. And they go through the following stages. They go through, firstly, a first reading. They then go through a second reading, a committee stage, a report stage. Depending on what happens at the committee stage, there may not be a report stage. We'll get to that in a second. A third reading. And then they go to the House of Lords for the exact same process before they then go and receive royal assent, assuming that the legislation does not die at any of these stages. Let's look at these in turn one at a time. OK, so the first reading is the most simple and it is the probably the least impactful of the processes through which legislation is uh, made. The first reading is simply the formal procedure of reading the bill to the House of Commons. 
they read the bill out loud to the House of Commons. They also make a declaration as to the compatibility of the legislation with the Human Rights Act in this part of the of the um, of the of the bill stage of the legislative process. But simply, this is what they do. OK, there is no room for a debate or for deliberation at this stage, nor there is there even a vote which takes place on taking the bill further. So every single piece of legislation, whether it pass into law or whether it just die at whatever stage through the process, will all go through a first reading process. And so it is only when we get to the second reading do we start to see um, deliberation, do we start to see debate, and do we start to see uh, legislation die owing to the fact that there aren't votes um, to let it pass further. This is where there'll be a lot more debate and discussion on the bill itself. Now, the debate and the discussion is um, going into... Um, the general overview of the legislation, potentially the implications of the legislation. Sometimes there might be discussion and debate about very key provisions of the legislation, but there isn't that much in terms of the um, really uh, minute details of the legislation, the specifics of the legislation. Rather, like I said, the second reading debates are supposed to focus on the intentionalities of the bill, the broader themes that pass in the passing of the bill, the general policy implications of the bill. Like I said, sometimes there may be discussions about particular provisions, where those provisions are very, very broad or very all-encompassing or very, very important. Um, but it is not a stage where we see the very, very specific details of the bill discussed and, and the minutiae of, uh, of the bill really, really um, amended and reformed and, and, and debated. At the end of the second reading, there will be a vote as to whether or not to take the bill to the next stage of the process. This will either be done verbally by the speaker, where you uh, the eyes or the nays essentially, um, and if there is a, a division, in they will clear the lobby, and you will have a, a formal vote take place. Essentially, when when the speaker shouts "division," clear the lobby, what they are saying is um, the 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 MPs have to go through and vote um, uh, vote manually essentially. And what they do and how they do that is they go will go through um, uh, one of two doors. One door being a, a, a the eyes to the right or the uh, or the nose to the left. And that's how they uh, vote for particular pieces of legislation or amendments or decisions, etc., etc., within Parliament. The next stage, if it goes to the next stage, if it doesn't die there and then, the second reading, and a lot of legislation does, but the next stage is the more substantive amendment stage. This is the committee stage, okay? Um, this is where the real finer details of the bill are discussed and debated. The committee will consist of a selection of members of parliament. Generally speaking, committees will represent and match the composition of the House of Lords. What does this mean? Oh, sorry, the House of Commons. What does this mean? Well, essentially, it means that if you have a, a, a House of Commons that is roughly 50% government party and then maybe 25% um, the major opposition and then there's maybe some other percentages um, there, the number of MPs and the percentage of MPs representing each party will be representative in the committee stage. So at this point, um, let's say at the time of recording before the 2024 general election has taken place, um, the committee stages will be majority conservative members of parliament with quite a substantial number of Labour MPs um, and quite a few um, SNP uh, members of parliament as well. That's generally how it is that how it is um divided and the reason for that of course is to show that essentially the committees should roughly reflect the will of the people and so the will of the people is reflected in the composition of the house of commons various amendments will be made to the legislation here and they will also be voted on in the committee in question there will be lots of back and forth about the finer details of the committee of the legislation the implication of particular provisions the wording of particular provisions and all these different things um, that are that are established here now, if there are amendments that are made to the legislation in the committee stage, and there, for the most part there are, um, those amendments will then be reported back to the report stage. Okay. Um, if there are no amendments, um, 
then there will be no need for the report stage because essentially the legislation will be exactly the same as it was when it passed through the second reading. But the report stage essentially allows the members of parliament within the House of Commons to go through and see what the major changes were to the legislation that were made at the committee and then they will debate on those changes and they will either um, vote for whether they ought to be accepted or they may vote for rejecting those amendments. If, like I said, there are no amendments, then there will be no need for a report stage. But it is very rare for a piece of legislation, especially when we're talking about some of the complex legislations that we see in, in, in the world today, um, it's very rare for those legislations to not have any amendments whatsoever at the committee stage. Finally, then, we have the third reading. Now, the third reading is almost as much as a, of a formality than uh, as the first reading, uh, because by this point, by the report stage and um, after the discussion on the report stage and the, and the passing and accepting of the amendments made by the committees, um, it, the legislation is essentially, is essentially complete at this point, okay? Or at least in the House of uh, Commons it is. Again, another formality process is done where there is another final vote on the bill. It's unlikely that you will see the bill fail at this stage, given that it has already passed all the previous stages. It doesn't seem to make much sense for an MP to then vote against it at this final stage. At that point, then, the bill will go to the House of Lords. It has gone through the House of Commons. It is then sent to the House of Lords, where it will go through the same process. It will go through a first reading, a second reading, a committee stage, a report stage, and a third reading. And it is for the House of Lords to really go and, and pick apart the legislation here. Now, where the Lords will make amendments to the bill, the bill will then have to be sent back to the House of Commons for the House of Commons to approve those amendments. Remember, the House of Lords is an unelected mem uh, chamber within, within Parliament. The House of Commons are the de democratically elected members of, of, of Parliament. So therefore, they will have the final say on every single amendment that is made by the House of Lords. This gives the House of Lords a sort of adjustment role, if you will. They, are, they essentially make small adjustments and they use some in some cases their their expertise in certain areas of, of of law and policy to make these amendments for the house of commons to then approve sometimes a bill can go back and forth for quite a while and this is a process known as ping-ponging essentially going back and forth from the house of commons to the house of lords obviously owing to the parliament's acts from the early 20th century we know that if the House of Lords tries to block legislation, um, they can only block it for a certain period of time, and then eventually the House of Commons will be able to override the rulings of the House of Lords because of the, um, the, the, the authority and the power that the House of Commons has over the House of Lords. Um, the Salisbury Convention tells us that uh, any legislation that forms part of the winning political party's manifesto should not be voted down and blocked by the House of lords because essentially the view there is if this is a manifesto pledge that is a piece of legislation then it is seen to be part of the will of the people and the unelected undemocratic house of lords should not be blocking or or, or opposing the unelected uh, sorry the elected will of the people and um, by doing so that's what the salisbury convention tells us Finally then, once it's gone through these stages and it's gone through the ping-ponging process, as I, as I like to call it, um, we have the Royal Ascent phase. Um, this is again a formality process, the, if anything more of a formality than any other stage of the process, and this is where the monarch will give Royal Ascent to the bill to create the legislation. The Royal Assent Act of 1967 means that the monarch doesn't even have to see the text of the legislation anymore. It used to be the case that the monarch would read the legislation and then give royal assent, uh, but because of the Royal Assent Act, there is not even a need to, um, to, to see the text. Simply put, the monarch will put their stamp of approval on the legislation and then let it go through, and there you go, sorted. The last monarch, by the way, that um, uh, ever refused to give royal assent to a bill was Queen Anne in 1707. So you can really tell that this is such a formality process that it doesn't even really make sense to even call it a process. But nevertheless, it is a process because this is the, if anything, it is paradoxically a formality that has no real legal standing whatsoever, but it also has the most legal standing since it is what 
essentially creates the law itself. It is what turns a bill which has no binding authority to a law which can then have binding authority and be interpreted by the courts and have to apply and be enforced against people. So it's quite paradoxical in the sense that the most important part of the legislative process, the turning of a bill into a law, is actually the most formal, uh, uh, just most of the formalities of the process as well. So that's quite interesting.